So I've had one man ask me, I would say close to over 100 times for this video. Every comment, every Twitter interaction, every message scrawled on my wall when I wake up in the mornings, all saying one thing. Hey man, are you covering Maggie this Friday? Well, I suppose persistence pays off, my boy, because that's exactly what I'm doing today. This is never going to work again, by the way. In the immediate aftermath of an outbreak of a disease known to cause necroambulism, or essentially what amounts to a form of a zombie outbreak, I say a form because unlike most stories involving zombies, this one seems to be pretty much not that big of a deal. But what's more alarming is, it's actually making somewhat sense, and seems fairly possible under the right set of circumstances. Anyhow, as the virus spreads and then wipes out city populations before spreading into more rural areas, eventually it just sort of ran itself out, mainly because some brain power is still actually accessible to those who are infected, just not as much as what makes a person human. So in today's episode, we get an awesome look at a disease progression stage by stage, the vector which delivered the plague to humanity in the first place, and why after seeing what happened in the last three years, yeah, I could totally see this happening in terms of choice. So let's get to it. All right, so for everyone that's a regular here, you know the standard drill, but for all those that don't, up on screen there'll be a timestamp. If you want to bypass the summary of this movie and get to the pathophysiology of this disease, head there. For everyone else who wants to hear me crack jokes while a family is about to lose someone to a zombie disease, when that happens actually in the future, if I'm not taken out within like the first three minutes, I can't guarantee that isn't going to be what I do anyways, because emotional IQ is not really my strong suit. So anyways, let's get to it. First off, oh God, it's Lionsgate, so there's definitely a copyright hit incoming, but we open up our story to a voicemail. A woman on the phone has gone to a city, which seems like a bad idea after, oh, you know, a literal zombie outbreak. Like, I'm jumping ahead right now, but her family are farmers, so they likely have food, although things probably aren't really that great concerning eating those crops, which we'll get to later. But anyhow, she decided to leave, so that's pretty brilliant. As Wade drives along, he is Maggie's father from a previous marriage, where the mom has apparently bit the dust. He has located Maggie in a quarantine hospital as she was bitten and infected. As he drives along, we get the news reports about the worldwide outbreak being under control, tenuously at best. Still a lot of problems for everyone in the future concerning actually getting this thing fully under control, but the numbers have started to drop simply because there's probably not that many people left. We also get some information about how the crops have also been infected and farmers are encouraged to burn their crops. There is no cure or vaccine currently to prevent the infection, but heightened sense of smell is a telltale sign as to what's up. As Maggie walks along, she's cornered by a bunch of men who are rounding up everyone who may be infected. Meanwhile, back at the hospital as Wade walks along, people aren't looking too hot. Skin that appears to be necrotizing, knocked out, and clearly infected. As the doctor walks up and tells Wade what's going on, her appetite is gone, the bite is considered severe, and time has passed since she got it. She's got about eight weeks total, but for some, it progresses faster, and they're not really sure why. Wade and Maggie reunite, as you do, and it's depressing because, uh, you know, she's gonna bite the dust too. As they stop by a gas station, I can't believe they even still have gas with this much of the population just absolutely shrecked. I mean, there's some crap going on in the world right now that gas prices are about to go sky high, so get ready for that. But, you know, you gotta get that oil, so uh, I said this a few years ago, but before the current disease issue started, I'm telling you, 2023 is the year of the electric car. Hard to believe I've been doing YouTube this long. As Maggie goes to check out what's up on the sunglasses, a zombie literally picks a fight with the Terminator and then gets straight up terminated. I literally still got it. So we get some apocalypse scenes. Everything pretty much sucks as everyone burns their crops, not a lot of people around, and in general, while terrible, this kind of actually would be a great thing for our population issues as a species. Just not great for our mental health. Of course, that happened before, if you really didn't know, which is kind of interesting. A long time ago, when we were still back in Africa, it appears as though our species hit a genetic bottleneck. What that means is our population numbers were so low, we almost went extinct. Groups survived around the edges of the continent near the coast, but man, we really came close to none of us being here. Maggie and Wade return home at this point to the rest of the family and have a great reunion. We meet the kids, uh, Bobby and Heather, or Molly, I think, I don't know. I don't really bother with names because they disappear in like four minutes. And the stepmother is Caroline. All the guys would say she's mighty fine. So we get these standard questions. What happened to your arm? Why are you sweating? Why do you look so hungry? All the things you ask zombies. As Maggie sits on the roof, her half-brother comes out to talk to her. His name is Bobby, so, you know, we know his name now. But he talks about how a bunch of kids in school got infected, and it sort of bums him out. He asks if her arm hurts her, and she says not anymore. Hmm, nervous system interactions, you say. It is rape. It's not rabies. Wade takes off to take the kids to their aunts, as Caroline looks like a straight-up trad wife. She's cooking dinner as Maggie reads a pamphlet on your zombie disease and you. Wade comes in to tell Maggie that dinner's ready, but she says she's not too hungry. She questions why he spent two weeks looking for her, and I mean, you are are his kid. Like, what sort of parent wouldn't look for their kid? All I'm saying is, that's the standard. At dinner, Caroline asks Maggie where her bandages are, to which Maggie Teenage Angst comes out, and she says, oh, I gotta go. I mean, I gotta side with Caroline on this one. Uh, no open wounds at the dinner table, Maggie. It's kind of gross. Okay, so you'll notice something in this movie. I, you 
remember how I was like complaining uh, about how it was always raining in Mimic no matter what? Well, this movie is sort of like that, except it's always on the cusp of a thunderstorm, which I have no idea why. I mean, you'll see, well, you won't really actually see it because there's no sound, but trust me, like every time something dramatic happens, it's like thunder rumbles and it's just like, why? Anyways, after Maggie calls some people, I'm not really sure who they were, to be honest with you, but she ends up hanging up because she just gets the voicemail. Wade then walks out to his mega screwed crops. It appears as though his plan is like everyone else's, burn it down and give it back to God. The next day, Maggie goes out to the swing set where we get some disease progression. Caroline is going to start the generator, Wade is chopping wood like a Chad, and Maggie is doing nothing to help. Meanwhile, on the news, some want to just drop those who are infected, others say they have to wait as they're still human. But during this, Maggie falls off the swing and breaks her finger, but the thing is, she doesn't really feel it, and it's oozing black blood, which historically isn't great. Maggie gets out and says, well, don't need this phalange anymore, and decides to just get rid of it as it falls into the garbage disposal. Whoops. So she runs off into the woods, bleeding black blood, and then grabs some dirt. She's more disturbed by the fact that she can't feel it. Although, as she does, she hears labored breathing. It's Nathan and his daughter. Wade tells him to say something as he approaches them, but Nathan says nothing, so he's forced to drop them with an axe, like a Chad. Okay, I gotta stop using Chad references. The little girl stands there, not attacking, but, you know, hey, she gets dropped too. After this event, the cops come out and say that Wade did nothing wrong, and, I mean, really, he did the right thing. Bonnie was actually the one who was keeping them there and didn't notify the cops. We also get this good cop, bad cop thing, Ray and Logan, Ray being cool, Logan being an unduly douche canoe. Wade tells them both to stay away, and if they show up for Maggie, it's not going to be good. So here's what happened. Bonnie kept the family locked up, and Wade has some trepidation about knocking out the family, mainly because the same thing is going to happen to Maggie. <laughs> Later that night, someone comes down the driveway, which uh, you never do at a farmer's house, just as a heads up. Farmers just stay packing heat. He goes out, and it's Bonnie. She tells him that it was just their daughter that was infected, but one night Nathan locked himself in there with her and became infected. She tried to get in, but couldn't. She then asks him what he would do, and he says probably the same thing. She requests to be taken to the bodies, to which Wade obliges, mainly because he's got a force multiplier at his back. So Bonnie is now hit with the big sad as the cops arrive in the morning to take the bodies and, I don't know, take her to jail? Seems a little ridiculous to me. Later on that morning, Wade then heads over to Bonnie's house, no idea really. I suppose just to check how maybe they were contained? Could be a possibility for him in the near future. Walking around, he finds carving in the walls before Nathan completely lost it, and a destroyed portion of the house, which appears to be how they escaped. So they will literally claw their way out of structures. This is one of those scenarios where there's really no right answer on what to do. Either way, it's not going to be great. Later that day, Wade gets a call from the hospital about tracking Maggie's progress. They go to see the family doctor, Vern. He basically straight up lies to Maggie, telling her that her asthma is gone, her lungs are clear, and her heartbeat is abnormally strong, so good signs. Probably not, though. Vern does the standard, it's all going to be okay, which yeah, she has pretty good bedside manner. I mean, we need more of that in the world. And he also tells her that Allie has been calling to hang out and that she should call her back. Vern then goes to tell Wade the real prognosis. The disease is progressing way faster. He says he has three options. Take her to quarantine, which Wade declines. Option two is give her the cocktail yourself that they give all the other infected. But I mean, he goes on to say it's literally the most painful thing imaginable all the way up until you drop. <laughs> There's got to be a better alternative to that, right? Which is just hot lead, which turns out to be option three, administer that lead himself. He tells Wade his report will show it's advancing slowly, but Wade has got some choices to make and soon. In complete bummer mood, Wade decides to listen to some music about Maggie. I'm guessing it's something they used to listen to. And as they eat, they begin bashing Caroline's food. And uh, I mean, I never bash a meal that's put in front of me, especially if you don't have to make it. There's also this bonding moment while Wade fixes his car, which also, if you uh, want to know a really good way to connect with your friends and actually get dudes to talk, let them work on something, whether it be like a car, the computer, building something. Uh, for some reason, as a species, uh, males tend to talk more when we're working with our hands. The human mind is fascinating. So they now talk about Maggie's drop mother and how she loved daisies. That night, Maggie's brain is definitely getting infected as she's got some PTSD from being bitten, as you might imagine. Checking her wound, there's maggots there inside of the flesh, as it's definitely necrosing at this point. Also, I promise the fox that's randomly seen throughout is definitely important later. That night, Maggie has Allie show up, which is her friend, I've gathered, because nothing gets past me. A group of them are getting together, including her ex-boyfriend Trent. They're all going to hang out as school starts soon for some, but probably not the others. So this is like their last big chance to do anything with the infected. Maggie relents and decides, sure bro, let's head out. Out of the bonfire, they get the standard social adeptness of a teenager. Obviously, some of them are scared, like Mason over here. He says that the infected need to be put down, present company excluded, which, okay bro, maybe not the time to be saying that. Trent says he has an uncle who works in quarantine. Says that they say they will hold your hand right up to the end, but the reality is they put you in a room with the other infected no matter what stage you are at, which results in a lot of people literally being eaten alive after being infected. 
Then the ones who are at the later stages get the cocktail. Trent is infected along with Maggie, as you could probably tell, so that sort of shuts up Mason. As Maggie and Trent go back to the bus to talk about their relationship and how he got bit, he was with Mason, basically just broing out, and Trent's dad figured out they got into his beer, so he put him to work in the fields the next morning. As Trent was working, he spotted an infected neighbor and tried to help, and then call out for his dad. As he did, she bit him, but what's interesting is, she looks like she regretted it. After that, Trent was basically completely screwed. So look, all I'm saying is, if I knew I was going to bite the dust as a teenager, and I was with my ex-girlfriend, and she seems interested in me, we're just sitting in the back of the bus, I hope I wouldn't get got without at least one notch under my belt. Also, the freaking thunder is rumbling again in the distance. The next morning, Allie and Maggie say their goodbyes, and that they will be together next weekend, which definitely ain't happening, as Maggie's eyes are starting to show she is basically turning really fast. Not ideal. Also, I'm starting to question the isolation policies here. I mean, they know biting definitely spreads it, but they still don't know if contact with the wound entering the mucosa membranes to the non-infected spreads this thing, because it probably does. So coming home, Caroline looks at Maggie and sees her eyes are milky white. Maggie then starts smelling the air and says that she smells food. Caroline says it's probably her dad cooking, and she goes down there to check. Nope, nobody's cooking anything. She realizes that Maggie is smelling Caroline, and she's smelling like a snack. Maggie asks what Wade was cooking, and she basically just nopes out of there, good choice. Later that day, Trent calls Maggie, and as she goes to his house because he didn't really say much, she sees his father has a force multiplier and is trying to coax him out of the room, but Trent isn't having it. She tries to talk to him, but he's still like, no bro, I'm not going to quarantine. He also smells his dad, so he doesn't want to attack him. But luckily, the man is there to break up the love fest because that's just what the man does. Grabbing Trent and taking him away to what amounts to a horrible fate. See, I like the cargo idea. Like, remember when I covered cargo a couple of months ago? The government issues like a brain spike to use at your leisure, not some horrendous cocktail that burns out your nervous system and is incredibly painful all the way through. At this point, Maggie is fairly bummed out and her breathing is starting to change. She hears some yipping in the distance as a fox has been caught. See, the fox is about to be important. She heads out there and begins to zone out as she's succumbing to portions of the disease. She goes to let the fox out, but instead figures out what the fox tastes like. Heading inside, Wade tries to grab her and see what's happening as she's covered in blood. Caroline says they have to take her in, but Wade says no. Also, the sound is very muffled, which seems to definitely be the nervous system struggling. Maggie apparently couldn't stop eating the fox, despite not wanting to, essentially, so that kind of freaks her out a bit. Caroline at this point is like, I'm outie. Maggie has a bath, which I figured maybe a shower would have been better, as she's just laying in, like, bloody water. Wade then goes to take out the fox, as somehow it's still alive, and Caroline has packed her bags. She gives Wade one last chance to call the quarantine. Wade says the wrong thing here and says, what if it was Molly? It's not a good thing to say to your spouse. So she leaves, and that is possibly uh, going to be damaging to the relationship. Wade then cooks some sausage and bacon for Maggie, to which she says it tastes bad. Only human meat will do now. So thunder rumbling again, even though we see the full moon, right? I mean, does it really thunderstorm this much in the Midwest? Very doubtful. As Wade sleeps, he sees Maggie was standing at his door. So you best believe I love my family, but I'd be locking my doors at night. As Wade goes to chop firewood the next day, the cops show up and talk to him, telling him that the time has come. Bad cop says he's going into the house. Now, I think martial law is still enacted, which means they can enter your home without a warrant, but really what that does is just enable PvP. Wade threatens Bad Cop as Ray tries to calm him down. Bad Cop then tackles Wade, and before Ray can put Wade down, as I suppose he has to at that point, Maggie exits the house and under pretty, like, a fair amount of strain, says that she's okay. The cops leave at this point because Ray says that's good enough for him. He knows, though, that she's skirting the line. After that great time, they then head into the woods. Wade had planted a bunch of daisies just after Maggie ran off. They had now started to bloom. Maggie tells her dad that he has to end her before she completely turns. Wade sort of agrees, but in reality, he's not going to pull it off. Let's be real. That night, when more thunder is in the distance, Vern shows up. He gives Wade the cocktail of medicine, but tells Wade his personal opinion is to use the old force multiplier instead. And at this point, Maggie is doing her last goodbyes and whatnot before laying on the floor. Wade then finds her and tells her to snap out of it, but she's getting real close to turning at this point. What's interesting is there doesn't appear to be any form of immune response even now. Wade goes to sit in his chair for the night and looks at pictures of Maggie as he pretty much understands this is about it. Early that morning, Maggie walks down the stairs as Wade pretends to be asleep. She approaches him and sniffs him. Being on the cusp of no self-control, but she still has a little bit, she kisses him and then nopes out of there. Again, family, but <laughs> no thank you. I mean, I guess this means Wade was gonna let her bite him. I, I mean, dude, you still have other kids and a wife and a post-apocalyptic society. I think you need to be there. She exits the house as Wade goes to grab the shell from the ground, and now she's gotten on the roof. Standing on the edge, she's still there, probably just for like a few minutes, like mental ability left, as her eyes are beginning to turn completely black. She then jumps off the roof and remembers her mother and playing as a child, which they say your life flashes before your eyes as you go. So that is essentially the brain firing those neurons as they all go 
dark. So that was a depressing movie. So now that you are sufficiently bummed out by the story, thanks Max, we can move on to what we are actually here for, the pathophysiology of this disease and how it afflicts the human meat suit and why probably a more aggressive isolation strategy would be needed because unless you are spraying yourself with Lysol every three seconds and religiously washing your hands, I just don't see how accidental infections aren't more of an issue. So let's begin with the virus itself, Necroambulist. At the risk of sounding like chubby emu, it's literally in the name of how bad this virus is, necro meaning dead tissue, and ambulist, or ambulism, meaning to walk or move about freely. Presenting to the ER. Anyways, so basically, mobile dead tissue is the term given to the virus as it began spreading through the human population. It's fairly clear though, this is not just specific to humanity, but instead has dire consequences for our meat suits and the things that fuel our meat suits, crops. As the virus begins running through crops, it's entirely possible humanity didn't even notice. You see, there are a lot of different things in the world, and being different species, and organisms helps protect against one disease wiping out all life. For instance, plants cannot contract HIV because they do not have the same type of cells and markers needed to allow the virus to propagate inside of the plant cells. Sort of like how humans can't contract Dutch elm disease. Even if we literally eat infected cells because we do not contain what the virus needs to propagate because viruses, believe it or not, are actually highly specialized. Animals being split from plants a very, very long time ago ensured that it was not an issue and we have different diseases based on viral adaptations. What's horrifying about Necroambulist is it appears to have jumped the kingdom barrier. Now jumping the species barrier happens all the time. I mean it's rare-ish but it does happen. But jumping the kingdom barrier is orders of magnitude more difficult as there is not a whole lot there to actually latch onto between the animal and plant species that would allow for a virus to thrive in both organisms. But this is also what makes this virus so much worse because it looks like our bodies quite literally do not even recognize it as a threat as no immune response appears present until it's too late. Even then I'm not gonna lie you, it seems entirely absent. So we must first establish the notion that since the crops were not only failing and withering themselves and the farmers were encouraged to burn their crops, that this must be a virus that is capable of infecting both animal and plant life. But there's a caveat to this. It seems like specific plants were infected and from what I can tell, there was nothing to suggest that other mammals could be infected by this virus. Of course, there is another option that we need to be aware of. While again, it's not suggested other animals were infected, such as mammals, I'm going to ask you a question. What tends to hang around crops? If you said rodents, then you're absolutely correct. Rodents have been the harbinger of disease for a very long time, so don't be that nerd in the comments saying they like rats. I mean, if you like rats, there's nothing wrong with a pet, but rodents will always bring disease, at least the wild rodents will. Anyway, so it's possible that burning the crops really was just to get rid of the rodents that were leaving infectious material on the crops that was later eaten, but there's still an issue with this as well, which leads me to believe it's actually infecting the plants. First, UV radiation does destroy viruses, so typically the infection route for rodents to infect crops would have the droppings be on the plant, but usually after it's already been harvested and washed. That way, it can still exist. Now, there are instances of, say, like listeria on lettuce because somebody did something in the field they weren't supposed to. Now, that can still get in and you can still get sick from that. So I'm saying the typical method and how this actual rodent dropping may be able to survive the cleaning process of crops. Another issue is the amount of crops infected. I'm all for a few being taken out by the necroambulus, but for the crops all over the Midwest, to have the same issue and with no real rodents being seen or discussed as the actual problem, it seems unlikely that the crops are not infected themselves. The final issue is the actual failing crops. Rodents really don't make crops fail like this. Something would need to be attacking the crops themselves on a cellular level. These parameters lead me to believe that the reality must be that somehow a virus jumped kingdoms, but only for those species in very close contact with one another. Humans have been farming for thousands of years, and it's something that we really don't actually think about, but this this is what led to our civilization as a whole. Without farmers and farms, the very fabric of our society would be totally shredded. So thank your farmers, my dude. But this also puts farmers in close contact with plants and animals, and with it, the passing of diseases. We know swine flu literally came from pigs having a form of influenza that jumped to humans and had a greater impact on our meat suits. This, however, was a species jump and required the farmers to be very close to their animals. For viruses and illnesses to jump under these same conditions, it's not common, but it does happen. Now with plants, Again, this is a much more difficult task as mentioned previously, but for the sake of argument in this video, if the virus originated in plants which yielded some crop failures over the decades, but never got too bad, humans would come into contact with these failed crops regularly, allowing the virus to potentially enter a farmer system and become familiar with our physiology. While possibly not at first resulting in any symptoms or disease, it's possible this virus may have been passed back to the crop as the farmer clearly had no idea they were even infected. And again, I want you to take this with a grain, like a huge grain of salt, because as far as we know, there are are no viruses that can jump from plants to humans and vice versa. However,
However, we also don't really have zombies up and walking around, now do we? But we do have some things in common with an actual plant cell, things like mitochondria. The only possibility I see working is that the virus can brute force its way into a cell because again, look at plant cells who have cell walls and animal cells who do not. Getting through a cell wall is difficult, but really not so much of an issue with an animal cell. Brute forcing into a cell would require the virus to not attempt to use a receptor of the cell and instead would just spear the thing. Seeing as there are a few connections between an animal and a plant cell, again, I think the mitochondria may be the target, altering the function of the mitochondria, as if you didn't know, mitochondrias do have their own genetic coding and functions, as it's agreed to be an ancient captured cell before we were even multicellular, or really, it was the first formation of eukaryotic cells. So I imagine that this is an RNA virus, so it would come into contact, which it could possibly use the mitochondria, but ribosomes themselves to create more of itself, much like any other virus would. I know, it's difficult to rationalize because again, we just don't catch plant diseases. Now, this isn't to say it does not happen. Some plant viruses can infect insects, for instance. Very rarely, but it can happen. However, the barrier between, say, vertebrates and plants remains there. Okay, at this point, though, I feel like with barrier in place, we sort of get how this is not just unlikely, but virtually impossible for a virus to jump from crops to humans. Taking a creative mindset, though, in this universe, it's possible that it did jump directly from plants to humans based on the amount of time they spent with their crops. Entering and exiting the human body, it may become familiar enough to infect animal cells. The other possibility is that either rodents has something to do with it, again, with the infection, or potentially the plant virus jumped to insects, and then possibly maybe those insects bit humans, allowing that barrier to be breached. But it's all the same effect. It ultimately resulted in humans succumbing to an infection and undergoing stages of infections. So let's take a look at that and possibly how you would even counter it. Shortly after being bitten, it would still appear that the virus does at least have some difficulty as it may not be fully adapted to humans, meaning us. Clearly the virus is spread via salivary glands, but I would say it's more than that. Likely every mucosa membrane is just an absolute breeding ground for the virus as it continues to build up within the body, which again, is why I say having these infected walk around freely is a bad idea. If they sneeze, cough, drool on a pillow when they sleep, or in general, have this infection within the fluids of their body if they bleed or get it on another person concerning their mucosa membranes, like their eyes, nose, mouth, open wound, or other areas, it's possible that it could spread. So parents letting their kids go hang out with infected people, like at a fire and just totally vibe, that's not happening. Humans are way too panicky for that. Once it has entered your body, it's clear it takes a few days or weeks for it to reach the point of viral load to begin causing issues in the surrounding tissue. However, once it does, the blood vessels then become very leaky, which gives us some clues as to what it's doing. It starts out around the immediate bite mark, but it seems like the virus would begin attacking the tissues to which the body immediately activates its first line of defense, the innate immune system. This results in white blood cells meeting the virus in open combat, and I love referring to the immune system as a mobilized unit. But this would begin taking in the virus and then attempting to destroy them. Realizing, though, that this wasn't going too well, they would eventually call for help, but not before releasing inflammatory proteins in order to suppress the spread. This, in turn, can cause the blood vessels to become something we refer to as leaky. The fluid and cells drip out of the blood vessels when they become damaged. As this happens, the blood cells meet their end, which results in the black web of vessels spreading all over the arm and back from the bite, at least from what we have seen with Maggie. With Trent, we see it in his actual face. When this happens, you might guess to steal some other issues for the tissues. With the blood vessels no longer properly delivering the blood as the vessels have been damaged, we see the skin begins to necrotize and turn black past the origin of the bite mark. As this happens, the person's infection begins to progress. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, where in the world is the adaptive immune system? Well, it's not going well for the front lines of the immune system. With the blood vessels being blocked, cytokine storms released from the immune system in order to deal with the invader are released because it seems to be really the only thing it can do. This, however, would be generally regarded as a bad move. Without access to the site of infection or at least massively reduced access, the virus continues to fester within the remaining cells until ultimately the area is lost. We see this when Maggie's finger is broken and she just yeets it off with a knife. That portion of the body can really no longer feel as the nervous system in the area is barely functional. With coagulated blood partially delivering maybe some oxygen, cells are kept functional, such as with the nervous systems, as that's priority, but those will soon fail too. The nervous system motor neurons can still contract the muscle, but it would likely be getting weaker by the hour as muscle cells began to shuffle off their mortal coil. Sensory information from neurons are also attacked as they are further out in the skin area, which has currently been cut off from oxygen and nutrition in large patches. So this is just the first portion. As the infection continues past a few days into weeks, the lungs are also attacked to a degree, resulting in inflammation, which we see as the raspy breathing and difficulty talking during certain portions, especially the later stages of the infection. Once this happens, the initial inflammation process then begins yielding more damage as time progresses with what appears to be an initial clearing of the lungs. This switchover is because the initial inflammatory response 
response ends because the innate immune system is completely depleted. And where the adaptive is supposed to take over, it doesn't actually appear to do so, if even at all, and even if it does eventually show up, it's at a severely reduced response level. After a few weeks, as the disease continues resulting in a change in about two to eight weeks, for some, they last longer. For others, it happens exceedingly quickly. From the bite zone, we can now call it what it is, sepsis caused by viremia. And this is the body's extreme response to infection, but unfortunately, this response is not mediated with the right countermeasures, so the body's abilities to deal with the invader are sidestepped in critical areas from the viremia or viral infection of the blood. Which, side tangent real quick, you know, this could actually uh, save your life. So if you ever injure your hand or your foot and get an infection and then see a red blood vessel just continuously form up your arm over a few days, uh, you need to get to the hospital immediately because once it reaches your heart, you are donezo. It's basically a march of infection. I forget the layman's terms, but you know, just remember that for the future. Anyhow, after this virus has its initial area of infection, this inevitably results in the viremia, which causes the body to become septic. Spreading throughout the circulatory system, this will result in what appears to be the nervous system issues in the limbs first, with blood vessels leaking all over the body as the innate continues to engage the virus. Ultimately fruitless, the body will turn to more aggressive measures, but the one it needs is an antibody response, which never seems to come. This would mean a couple of things could be happening. So you have something known as a dendritic cell, which after a macrophage ends up destroying a bacteria or virus, the dendritic cell will come and pick up the pieces and then present them to the B cells. Moving through with these pieces, eventually a B cell will be determined to be the right matching shape and then will propagate and create antibodies. But because this doesn't happen, I mean, we see no fever, no swelling of the lymph nodes, no active response, it looks like the dendritic cells are stopped in their tracks, possibly by being infected themselves, which is bizarre because sepsis actively results in a massive fever. But this seems to imply that the body is only half activated in terms of responses, but it is activated enough to cause issues with the blood vessels themselves. It may be because the body simply does not have anything that matches as this usually hard barrier between plants and animals is then breached. Anyhow, eventually this blood vessel destruction in the body results in other issues besides the lack of feeling and limb decay. Moving into the head of a person, the eyes become milky because they are actively being starved for oxygen. As the eyes begin to meet their end, this would result in them becoming really hard to see, which the other effect results in other systems attempting to make up for this issue, such as hearing and sense of smell being increased. With the eyes mostly destroyed due to the blood vessel destruction, any nerves that go to senses in some respect, like the auditory nerve running to the ears, would also begin to show signs of forming issues, such as when Maggie could only hear the muffled shouting of her father and stepmother. While this is only glancing and may not be a permanent issue, it shows the nervous system in the skull is beginning to be affected. Which you might be asking yourself, why is this the case? Why is it possible for the brain to survive as long as it does if the body just looks terrible? Well, if you didn't know, the giant nerd organ inside of your skull likes to live a fairly removed lifestyle from the rest of the body, and honestly, it's for good reason. An infection in the body needs to be contained to the body as the brain coordinates a ton of functionality and must remain in homeostasis if at all possible. This explains why it takes so long for the disease to spread despite areas being completely inundated with the virus and actively experiencing necrosis. The blood-brain barrier is tough. It allows nutrients and oxygen through, but can and will for the most part stop other invaders from entering this area. This is critical to our survival as the immune system has a very limited presence in the brain itself. If something gets in, it's hard to get it under control. These platelets stop a lot from entering the brain and wreaking havoc on everything, which would result in the end of the body for something as simple as like the common cold. So thanks, blood-brain barrier. But a problem still remains. With viremia quite present all over and sepsis becoming worse, this causes issues for the central nervous system. The largest being it literally distorts how our brain functions and with things like meningitis due to inflammatory chemicals being pumped out at least during the initial phases, this would swell the meninges and this would over time alter how the infected acts. It seems to me that while the blood-brain barrier is great, we know it's not perfect and infection does spill over as viruses begin infecting the brain of the person, just at a slower rate than the rest of the body as they were more resistant to the invasion due to the physical barrier there. Once it starts, however, the result would be quite quick. The eyes are a good indicator of how much viral load is in the bloodstream for this to happen as blood clots and black splotches begin taking over the eyes before turning them totally black. The brain would begin to struggle to retain control as the cerebrum would be necrotized by the virus, seeing as the neurons would likely be destroyed in the process. Eventually, over the weeks, a tipping point would be reached. Enough of the cerebrum, likely the frontal lobe, would be destroyed to make logical thought more difficult. The old brain at the base, which contains the hypothalamus, pons, medulla, olfactory bulb, basically instincts and sensory would still somewhat be functional, which now we see something else, sense of smell becoming stronger. I believe the virus enters the olfactory bulb and may actually, to a degree, make it more active for regular smells. With this new activity, the brain would begin relying on smell more readily as eyesight becomes far worse. 
worse. It literally comes down to the fact that these nerves connecting to the olfactory bulb have remained functional due to proximity to the brain of the person, and the sensory organ itself is kept going by the blood-brain barrier, providing some protection. The protection is displayed actively with something like the vagus nerve that runs through your intestines and then up to your brain. Early in the infection, we see this person doesn't really want conventional food as their appetite wanes, but then comes back in a big way later once the body realizes it's starving. Initially, this is because the vagus nerve is no longer relaying information actively to the brain as it's in contact with the viremia, likely resulting in a lot of its own destruction. Later, however, the brain realizes the body is starving with or without the vagus nerve information and freaks out as it's still functional to a degree. This causes them to become desperate and eat anything. Ultimately, though, it won't matter. As the weeks passed and the infection progressed, we see the entire body is afflicted and destroyed. While at the end, they are running on pure instinct and a need for food, and with humans smelling like food, this means they are hunting us or at least taking a bite out of us should they happen by. Eventually, the brain itself would continue to decay in the skull to the point that the infected would drop. It's likely that the government didn't so much get Necroambulus disease under control, but those who were infected display the zombie-like symptoms just before the very end. This means that how do you fix this? You simply wait. This disease is going to run its progression, and if you stay separated for probably literally just a few days, the body will have gotten to the point that even instinct can't keep them going, and they will drop, and that'll be that. The other thing you could possibly do is continue feeding people to make sure that they still have nutrition that they need despite not even being hungry. It's sort of like force-feeding yourself as your stomach will actually still break down nutrients. Now, the other thing you would obviously have to do is administer antiviral medication, something that disrupts the actual virus reproducing within your cells, like a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. This would ensure that the virus cannot continue to spread and may actually give you time to get a vaccine or some form of medication that can counter it. But it's all about time and keeping the virus at bay so that you do not go completely septic and then go into septic shock. Necroambulist appears to be a virus that jumped the kingdom barriers from crops to humans or potentially from insects on the crops to humans. As this appears somewhat possible, if not extremely rare, and impossible in our world. Once entering humans, it would result in viremia that the body would respond to in terms of using sepsis, which is the over-exaggerated response to an infection. This, however, would cause more issues than it would solve. The adaptive immune system appears to have been subdued in a way likely resulting in the dendritic cells being contained as not to alert the adaptive immune system, which allows the virus to continue to flourish. It's also possible that since plants don't infect humans with their viruses, the B cells just did not have an adequate response. But I find this not as likely, seeing as based on physics, likely something by some chance would be able to stop this virus. So it's not really what you come into contact with concerning antibody production. But this in turn would cause a person to, at the very last point, lose control of their minds as they slipped into an instinctual drive to survive, despite their bodies being almost completely destroyed. However, this is the last phase, and as such, the infected would likely only last a few days before succumbing to the environment, as if they go without basic needs, they will be destroyed, considering that this is a purely biological disease and plays within the parameters of life and our meat suits.